Exodus 20, you're going to continue the series we're in here, going through the book of Exodus and taking what is for me at least a fresh, fresh look at the character of God in this book and being amazed by how God reveals himself. And, and, and one of the things I'm seeing here as I go through chapter 20, which is this really well-known passage on the Ten Commandments, is I'm seeing more and more clearly how the, the character of God, the heart of God, the redemptive heart of God is displayed here in ways completely consistent with what we see later in Scripture in the coming of Jesus and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus in our place, that God is God is not inconsistent. He, he doesn't have a split personality. I think often when people think about the Ten Commandments found here in Exodus 20, there's a view of God, at least for me, there has been this view of God that he's like um, distant, moody, temperamental maybe, quick to anger, uh, the, the kind of idea, the, the lightning bolt wielding, throwing God at times because of how this, this passage can be interpreted. And, and we're walking through what we're calling rethinking the Ten Commandments. And by that I mean how, trying to understand it in light of what we see later in Scripture concerning the heart of God revealed in the person and work of Jesus. And, and in many ways, this, this book invites us to read it sort of backwards, meaning we're, we're invited to read and understand God most clearly through the lenses given to us through Christ and what we know about Him and, and how He reveals God's heart, God's redemptive heart for His people. So that even when God does things that we humanly interpret as being severe or um, at times harsh, that that has more to do with our perception, has more to do with flaws in our thinking than really some kind of inconsistency in God. And so I want to illustrate that for you as we get started. Uh, you've probably heard of the the ink blot test. You see psychologists using that test and they'll have a picture of this ink on a paper and, and the person will look at it and they'll have to say what, what they see. And one of the purposes of that test is to, is to reveal something about the personality of the observer. It says something about what they, what they value, what they're attracted to, or what they're repelled by. It speaks to their fundamental presuppositions or their personality type. It, it reveals something. What, what they perceive when they see that image reveals something about themselves. Uh, another example of that, maybe a simpler example of that is looking at the clouds and seeing shapes in the clouds, right? You see like, I don't know, a car or, or an elephant. I mean, why, why, do you, why do you draw that conclusion? Not because there's actually an elephant floating in the sky, but because you have a preconceived notion of what an elephant looks like and you see a shape that reminds you and, and, and so you sort of project what you have this prior understanding of. Well, I think we, we do the same thing when we, when we read Scripture Naturally speaking, we, we have this tendency to do the same thing. We, we project, we impose upon God ways that we are. With the inkblot test or looking at shapes in the clouds, what happens is we see what we want to see. We see what we're preconditioned to see. Same is true when we observe the character of God. And this speaks to how, how deeply we need His grace, how we need what Paul says in Romans, we need to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, that our minds would be brought into submission to, uh, that, would be, that we'd receive from God truth, that we would see Him not as we are predisposed to seeing Him, but rather we would see Him as He is, as He reveals Himself. And, and frankly, that takes a miracle, and the beginning of that miracle is when we are confronted with the good news of the gospel, which is a both uh, life-shattering and healing event when, when we're brought to conversion, when we see God clearly as our rescuer, and, and not just in some intellectual way, but when we truly are confronted with the fact that we are, that we're rebels against our Creator, that we are desperately enslaved in sin 
that sin wreaks havoc in our lives and we, we need our God. We need his salvation. We need his forgiveness. We need his deliverance. I mean, when that becomes valuable to us, it begins the process of flipping everything right side up. If we begin with an interpretation or a preconceived notion or presuppositions that are upside down, the gospel is what flips it back right side up to where we begin to see God clearly as he, as he is. So in a sense, when we read Exodus 20 and think about the Ten Commandments, we are, we are interpreting the Ten Commandments in the context of Christ, the Gospel, the New Testament. So this morning is kind of like introduction part two. Now, I won't be here next week, but the following week, we're going to begin marching through and probably take one commandment per week and look at each of them. But for this morning, I want to kind of give another introduction, introduction part two or part B or whatever, and, and look at some places in the New Testament that help us understand what God was up to and how God is revealing his heart here in Exodus 20. Uh, let's read it. Let's read Exodus 20. I'll say a few things about the context of, of Exodus 20, and then we'll look at some New Testament passages together. All right? This is verse 1, beginning there. It says, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And here we go with the commandments. Number one, and of course, they're not listed this way biblically, but we've kind of humanly created this list. But begin with number one here, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You should not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. There are the familiar Ten Commandments. And contextually, you recall, these are given when Moses and the people of Israel are wandering in the wilderness and there are hundreds of thousands of them. Big group. And God has here on Mount Sinai revealed himself through these natural phenomena of thunder and lightning and earthquake and fire and smoke. This amazing spectacle, this display of God's greatness and power. And he's communicating with Moses. And then Moses is communicating with the people. And this law is given. And, and there's a practical level to this to where Moses is judging the people. He, he's trying to govern, again, hundreds of thousands of people, and they need, practically speaking, some clear parameters. And, and, and this is partly God providing for that need. So on one level, it meets that practical need. On another deeper level, this has everything to do with the spiritual reality of, of human beings. Everything to do with what rightness looks like, what life looks like, given here in the Ten Commandments. And we said many times now, but it's important to highlight this in terms of seeing God's character throughout this book. Over and over, you see God pursuing his people. And several times it says, I, I, I brought you to myself. I, I brought you out of Egypt and bondage under Pharaoh, and I brought you to myself. He says in the beginning of chapter 20, I just read it, verse 2, you, you, I brought you out of the house of slavery where you were stuck and I brought you to myself. And the, the implication of that is I, I brought you to freedom. And, and we need, um, and I think what I'm seeing, which has been really encouraging to me, is it's like we, we have to like redefine these terms. And, and I've had some good conversations with 
some of the ladies and, and others in our men's group about like just how we, we have these natural ways of hearing these words. So you hear the word uh, judge, and right away you, you have a, this sort of a feeling to that word, right? Uh, you hear the word commandment, and that feels a certain way to us. You hear the word law. Of course, the Bible throughout re refers to this section and really everything Moses wrote in certain places referred to as the law. And the word law has a feeling to it. So we say things like, so-and-so really laid down the law. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean it's just like, it's kind of like, hey, it's his way or the highway. You better do what he says or else. I mean, we have a certain human way of understanding these terms. And even this past week, I noticed when God says, I brought you out of the house of servanthood or slavery. There are places when God says, I'm bringing you to myself so that you'll serve me. But is, is being a servant of Pharaoh different from being a servant of God? You better believe it. <laughs> because one takes from you, exploits you, and the other gives to you. One enslaves you, and the other liberates you. So you see, it, it requires careful thought. It requires consideration of what the context tells us. What God, how he reveals himself, how that shapes our understanding and our interpretation of these terms, that if we're not careful, we just run with our preconceived human ideas just like those ink blot tests or the shapes in the sky. We just project. And so over and over, God's just, he's revealing himself. He's revealing his heart. He's revealing his grace. He is, he is coming for his people. It says, you know, he, he saw them in their suffering. He, he heard their groans and their cries for help. He knew them. Uh, he says in places, I'm coming down to rescue you. I mean, all this language is, is a, of a gracious God coming to, to, take care of his people. And then as they wandered in the wilderness, they've lacked water and God provides water. They lack food and God provides food. They're, they're threatened by the Amalekites and God protects them. And th this is their God. He is bringing them to life in union with himself, in relationship with himself. And that is fully consistent with how he is operating in our lives orchestrating circumstances to show us our need and to teach us to live. And just like for them, we said in Sunday school this morning, for them, when God was teaching them to live in union with, with him, it felt like death. When you're starving, it feels like death. And yet that's how he taught them to depend upon him, to be in a relationship with him, to live. In. And so we go through things in our lives that are hard. It feels like death, but it's God teaching us to live in Christ and in him. I want to say a little bit more about the law as practically necessary before we we jump to the New Testament. Can you imagine life without law? Can you imagine driving without traffic laws? As some of you guys have been uh, overseas, to other you know big cities, we've been to big cities in India. Some of you've been to like Mexico, other places where. There, there are some laws in India. It seems like there are no laws. Like about it's just com complete chaos. So, like it feels really nice just to drive on the roads in America, having been on the roads in India. The the the, the, the laws, the rules, the lights, the lines in the road. I mean, that's helpful, right? Practically speaking, and we all have laws of the household. We have rules in school. We have civil laws that we need, and we have police officers and judges and other officials to enforce. Though, and that's, that's a necessary part of, of life. And uh, even think of, as parents, right? I mean, it, it is a helpful thing that God reveals to us what is appropriate and not appropriate in terms of behavior. And, and there are consequences, and there need to be, for the restraint of the flesh in our households. And again, in society at large. So there's that practical level, and then there's the deeper level in terms of spiritual realities. And that's more of what we're emphasizing here, but I wanted to just acknowledge that and make sure that's very clear. 
and we see that that benefit okay so so three things I want us to think about and walk through briefly this morning before we have communion together first of all the fact that the law has a, a ministry of life to us secondly the law has a ministry of, of death to us and thirdly the law gets us to Christ it gets us to the death and life of the gospel and say a little bit about each of these which which all harmonize perfectly with the character of God displayed for us in the coming of Christ to rescue us. So first of all, the law has a ministry of life to us, having come from God himself. In Romans 7, Paul says that, and, and you, don't, you can turn there if you want. I'm going to jump around a little bit for the sake of time, and this won't be comprehensive because there's way more in the New Testament than I could cover. But I want to just give you certain, sort of strategically give you certain passages that help fill out how we understand the law. Okay, and In Romans 7, Paul is giving the example of the, the final commandment, thou shalt not covet. So he's referring to the Ten Commandments as he speaks of the law here. And he says in verse 10 that the, the commandment was to result in life. That The commandment literally was unto life. Interesting. He says in verse 12 that the commandment of the law is holy and righteous and good, which makes it really clear that the problem when it comes to law and law keeping, the problem is not with God or with the law. The problem is with us. The law is holy and righteous and good. He says later that the law is spiritual, which I take to mean it, it has spiritual origin. It comes from God. It comes from the mind of God and the heart of God. And it's not God like playing a trick on people and like just having a gotcha moment with this law that we can't keep. I mean, it, it does describe what righteous life looks like. What life ought to look like for a creature, for a creature under the creator. That's, it describes that. It's, as I said last week, it's like a, like a superficial shell that describes and depicts for us what life looks like. And Paul sees that as all, all good. In Exodus, it was God offering himself to his people and giving the law was part of that. It wasn't contrary to that, it was part of that. So in that sense, it, it was a life-giving ministry to them. Ultimately, it's part of his plan to get us to Jesus that we're going to consider later. So the problem with it is not the law itself. It's an extension of, of who God is. The problem with it is, is you and you and me. And, and when we who are uh, little G gods, ever since the garden, we wanted to be like God. As we said earlier, that's what explains why we tend to create caricatures of God, because we're sitting in his place, and so we feel like we get to define him. It's all the same stuff. So when it comes to law, and, and you connect law and what God communicates with a fallen human being, and guess what happens? That human being either completely disregards it in creating their own law, or they say, well, I'm going to follow this to create life for myself, and um, I'm going to sort of make all this manageable, and I'm going to do it my own way. And, and the result of that is really, truly only death. It, it is not the life and the love described by law. It is, it is emptiness. It is death. It is, it is not that. It is devoid of relationship with the God who gave the law, and thus it is, it is just death. Which leads to the second thought I want us to consider. The law has a ministry of death to us. And so there are places where the New Testament speaks of it in terms of, hey, this is part of God bringing us to life. And there are places where it refers to it as a ministry of death. 2 Corinthians 3, Apostle Paul, same author, talks more about it. And there he says it's a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. He says the letter kills Romans 7, where we just were, I mean, he, there he says, um, I hear law, and it's like this: the sin within me revives. It, like it, I hear what God says is appropriate, and I find this impulse to do the opposite of that.
In Romans 5, Paul says, law came, listen to this, that, that transgression might increase. That transgression might increase. That it might multiply. When we read it, that we might see, oh my gosh, like I, I am... I am going astray there and 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 there. And that reveals something God says about himself back there in Exodus 20 when he says, look, I've done all this. I've displayed my glory in these ways. I've given you my law so that you might not sin, so that you might not miss the mark. That's the that's the idea. And 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 we said last week, it's missing the mark of God himself. And and God says, I'm going to give you ample evidence that you're missing me. So when you hear the law, and in honest moments, you realize, wow, I've broken that one, and 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 that one. And Jesus comes in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount and says, oh, by the way, it's not just if you murder somebody, it's if you even have anger in your heart. And like, oh, gosh, now that one, and that one, and that I mean, it just, God is like revealing to you over and over and over and over again in countless different ways, you, you need me, he's saying. There is no hope for the fulfillment of the law apart from, from God. There is no life. Book of James says if you've broken one law, you've broken all of them. I mean, could God have made it any more clear that like you're you cannot there's nothing you have here. You're powerless, you have empty pockets. You've got nothing. The law serves that good purpose in our lives. It's a, it's a ministry of death to us to show us you're dead. Life apart from your, your maker is death. In one sense, it shows us uh, God's better at being God than you are. Even though deep down there, we all sort of want to be, think we are, assume it would be better if we could be. I mean, but life and love, what we were made for really bring nothing to the, to the table with that. Nothing. So thirdly, the, the law brings us to Christ, the death and life of the gospel I want to show you Luke 10. Turn to Luke 10. This is Jesus himself talking about the law. And I want you to see what he says. Luke 10, verse 25 through 28. It says, a lawyer stood up. Now, in those days, and we have a certain understanding of what a lawyer is today, but in those days, a lawyer was an expert in the law, meaning the, the Old Testament law. Okay, A Bible scholar. A lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. And catch this here, okay? You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Go ahead. Hey, you actually have a pretty good understanding of the law, so go ahead and go do it, and you'll live. Because that describes, that's what life is. And it's interesting, it says, but wishing, next verse, to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Okay, I just need more information, so I can go and, and do that and live. So I'm going to be an heir of eternal life. How? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm going to be an heir of eternal life. How do I go about securing that for myself? And she says, here you go. You've said it yourself, so go do it. What, what is the presupposition there of this man? Oh, I, I, okay, I have, wow, this, this in some way requires action on my part, compliance on my part, effort, and and what the New Testament goes on to reveal unmistakably later is that being an heir of life is by faith, not by works. So when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 
I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. As I explained last week, that means like fill it up, fill it full. Like everything described by the law, he personifies. He lives it. He relates rightly to his father and to every other human being around him every millisecond of his life. And he does it in our place. And that is life, and it is a gift of his grace to you. If it would have been of works, then it would be a wage earned, Paul says elsewhere in Romans. He says in, in Galatians, if there, if there would have been a law that could impart life, then there would be, but there isn't. <laughs> the only way we can live is if God freely gives us life. And what does it mean that God gives us life? Here's what it means. It means God gives us himself. He gives us relationship. He restores us in Christ. He reconciles us in Christ. He bonds us to himself in Christ. He gives us his spirit. Christ is in us. We are in Christ. We are inseparably bonded to our maker. And he has done absolutely everything to make that possible. It is received as a gift. So the problem with the law, whether it's the Ten Commandments or the way some people divorce New Testament commands from their context, the problem with any one of those approaches is it presupposes that I contribute something. Whereas the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus unmistakably declares you contribute nothing. The only thing you can contribute is death. God says, you try to live as God, you'll surely die. That's the best we've got. But we have a God who loves us, who not only describes life and love, but who comes in the person and work of Christ and lives it and provides for us to know that everything has been taken care of for life. Back then it's water and bread. And Jesus says, I'm your living water and I'm your living bread, doesn't he? He is life. And for us to know, to be amazed that we are just recipients of that is amazing. Because just like in your life and my life, there are aspects of my life that I am very aware of how I am failing. And I don't mean like, you know, I wish I could have been an astronaut and I failed, okay? I don't mean like those, I mean like how I treat people. I mean like the fact that I know that it is only death and misery for me to be so self-absorbed and yet I find myself often seemingly always self-absorbed and how I overlook other people and mistreat other people or have attitude problems on the road. I mean, literally several times when I talked about traffic laws earlier, that was like very pertinent for my day. There's some things on the way to church this morning. Two things happened that had to do with people violating traffic law that ticked me off. The, the, the examples are countless, Okay. But to think that God sees all that, he sees beneath the exterior of what I can put on my little Sunday smile for you and everything, but he sees to the root and yet he doesn't look to me at the core of my being and expect me to generate life there and expect me and say, Jeff, what's your problem? Why? I mean, suck it up, have a better attitude, be more this, be more but says, look, I, I see you in that misery and I give you everything. And it starts with you knowing you're forgiven. You're forgiven for trying to dethrone me, Jeff. I, I had the situation and I, I'll just sort of try to vaguely illustrate this. It just speaks to our problem. I think like in a way, God almost says to us, okay, you want to be God for a little while? I'll let you be God. You want to prophesy about what's going to come true 
for example, in your relationships, and there's someone I've seen recently in this, this relationship sort of squabble I've had, and I've realized, hey, this person has a prophecy about where they thought this conflict was going, and sure enough, that prophecy came to fulfillment, where the relationship is now estranged. And it's like, wow, this is a great illustration. It's like almost like God says, okay, you want to be God for a while? Okay, I'll let you be God for a while. Oh, you want to make sure, you want to take the safety and prosperity of your family into your own hands? Okay, I'll let you do that. Enjoy your sleepless nights and your paranoia and being enslaved by that almost always. And the gazillion other examples we could give of that. And God said, look, I see you there and I have mercy on you. There, uh, in the summertime, we were back home. I, I may have referred to this here before, but it's just coming to my mind. I just, I, it was so vivid. We went to see this uh, play about the life of Jesus at the Sight and Sound Theater in Pennsylvania, which is like this big, big, you know, a lot of professional, super elaborate productions here. It's not, I thought it was going to be hokey and cheap, but it's very professional. Um, Oh, I want to say some sarcastic, funny things right now. I'm not going to about Pure Flix. I just saw this new subscription service for not Netflix, Pure Flix. We'll, we'll not talk about that. No, that's I can't. Um, you can come to your own conclusions. You're good at doing that. Come form your own conclusions about Pure Flix. Sign up today for your subscription. Anyway, um, so we're at the Sight and Sound Theater, and there's this Jesus production, and that you remember the man who was who is possessed by the legion of demons, that story in the Gospels. Well, there's the depiction of that. And here's this guy who's miserable. And nobody wanted to go anywhere near him. And in the play, the disciples see Jesus going toward him. Like, no, don't go toward that guy. He's dangerous. He's this, he's that. And Jesus goes right up to him. In his misery and blackness and enslavement, to where everybody in the world said, forget that guy, avoid that guy. And Jesus goes up to him and embraces him and speaks truth to him and sets him free. That's what we call mercy. The God of the book of Exodus is a God of mercy. The God of the New Testament is a God of mercy. And Jesus is the embodiment of mercy. And a big part of that is him saying, you are forgiven for your cosmic treason. You are loved by your heavenly father. And not only have I loved you, but I've provided everything for you. The, the fruitfulness of your life that I've foreordained, I have fully provided for. So that the failures, the, the sin, the violations, the transgressions, name your term, are opportunities to revisit the heart of a giving father. His forgiveness, and I'll, I'll close with this. I, um, in high school, when I had a mullet, I loved Metallica. And then went through a fundamentalist blackout in which I didn't allow myself to listen to Metallica. And I gave away my favorite Metallica album CD. I can picture it. I gave it away. Should have burned it at a camp, right, Jill? That's the right way to give it, get rid of it. But I, I gave it away. Actually, I think I sold it. I think a buddy of mine gave me like twenty bucks for it. Anyway, so for a long time, well, I've you know rediscovered Metallica, and uh, and I heard this song recently, "The God That Failed," and I think I gotta look up the lyrics to that song. And the lead singer and songwriter James Hetfield wrote that song after his mom had died, his parents were Christian scientists and that's a version of kind of like you, they would say cultic subgroup of Christianity that believes that you don't go see doctors. You, you trust God to heal you and you practice sort of a biblical form of the power of positive thinking and you go on your way. Well, his mom practicing that ended up dying and probably could have either prolonged her life or been healed, but she refused to see a doctor. And so as you can imagine, the young kid growing up, he says, well, God sucks. I'm done with that. And so now you know what inspires the lyrics of some of these songs. But now he's, you know, probably in his 50s. And I was looking up some interviews where he talks about how he views God. And he said some fascinating things that I thought, man, I wish I, wish I could have a conversation with a guy like that. Because I think much of what 
he is understood to be Christianity is, is a misrepresentation and a caricature of the character of God, unfortunately. But at any rate, you know, God's big enough to do what he's going to do in people's lives. But he, he said this at one point in the interview, after saying he believes in a God of sorts and he believes that God has been gracious to him in ways he can't even understand or explain. He said, to be human is to be able to, I'll say, mess up. He used another term. He said, sinning, making mistakes, whatever you call it, is, is how we learn. And he said, I, I've learned one thing. I, the best is, is sort of all you can do from that is learn to somewhat be somewhat gentle with yourself. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself crazy. And regardless of you know what fed his thing, it doesn't even matter. But, but I heard that and I thought, gosh, it, here is a, an evidence of the heart that says, I know that I mess up. And somehow, some way, I, I need that to be okay. And I'll tell you right now, the Ten Commandments are not an opportunity for us to prove our good character. The Ten Commandments are God's way of proving His. And though we mess up, so to speak, we miss God and evidence all the manifestations of relationship killing deadliness, God says it's okay because I've forgiven you and washed it away and I've given you life and everything necessary. I've poured my love into your heart, it says elsewhere, Paul says that. This is a God who gives and gives and gives and gives. And, and, and our human nature, because we are not that way, we tend to view God as not being that way. And, and the voices oftentimes, sadly, in the church would portray God as not being that way, as being some kind of demanding taskmaster who expects something from us that we don't even have and we can't possibly produce. I mean, all the voices in our own heads and around us that portray God that way. And here God is saying, look, I, this is how I really treat my people. This is who I really am. And in blazing glory, that's why it says so cool in 2 Corinthians 3, that the ministry of death, he says, graven on stones. I mean, literally Moses had the tablets, right? I mean, God gives his commandments and that's all a ministry of death. But he says, but it came with glory. He says, but it is far surpassed by the glory of the ministry of life coming through Jesus Christ who embodies life and love and who gives it to us as a gift. Secured by his life and death in our place.